Welcome to AI, Government and the Future, a podcast by Corner Alliance. We explore the intersection of artificial intelligence, government and the future with your host, Alan Pence. We work with government to create results. We ignite your agency's mission by helping you to design and implement high impact and innovative federal programs in AI, broadband, cybersecurity, public safety, and more. Being a government ally is at the core of all we do. Introducing your host, Alan Pence. Hey, welcome. Uh, today we have with us Aileen Chaveau. Aileen, why don't you tell us uh, what you're currently doing and what you've just got done doing. Well, hi everyone, and thank you, Alan, for having me today. Right now, transitioning between uh, my position as Senior Advisor on Digital Policy and Economic Affairs at the European People's Party at the headquarters in Brussels. Uh, towards a new position, uh, which I will start very soon at the European Commission at DG Connect as a policy analyst. Oh. Um, so I am in Brussels following uh, very closely EU legislation, but also beyond. Great. And DG Connect is... Uh... So it's it's the Director General of the European Commission that focuses on the communications, networks, um, and historically also telecoms. Excellent. That'll uh, be so. helpful for our American yeah. listeners. So you've had a pretty incredible journey, um, kind of covering from the early days of the internet up to now, obviously what with the EU is grappling with, with AI. So paint a picture for our listeners of how the conversation around digital technologies and more particularly interested in AI here has evolved over the years in European policy circles. There's been this political push when the current commission took office in, in 2019 with the, the newly appointed president at the time, Ursula von der Leyen, um, committing to proposing an AI regulation within the first 100 days of the mandate. And, you know, Parliament pretty some work in parallel uh, with the committee on AI, consultations happen with stakeholders. And the idea was to replicate uh, the EU's move to adopt the, the GDPR, the General um, Data Protection Regulation, uh, which was adopted in, in 2018. It was already touted as a success, as like a bl- blueprint you know, for the world to, to follow. Part of the idea that the EU must uh, carve out a third way between China and the US and could take the lead as a regulator. So I think the recent years have been more about discourse around digital technology, something that we've learned uh, run free in the past, like with the internet, but that now had to be controlled either through regulation or by enhancing its production domestically, uh, you know, production of, of technology. Ideally both, but the EU worried that it wouldn't have what it takes to weigh in with the actual innovation and, and tech leadership going on elsewhere. So there was a realization of that fear that we're falling behind um, in the innovation race and losing sovereignty, becoming a digital colony. And and regulation was supposed to be a recipe to ensure that we slow down that fall. And I think we've come to a balance in the conversation. So European circles do agree that regulation is needed now, but that innovation must be preserved. And you now hear things from ministers like, yeah, okay, for regulation, but you have to be careful not to overregulate and constrain the ability for Europe to develop the technology as well. And that conversation is more vocal than 10 years ago on technologies in general, for sure. And there seems to be also a consolidation of the debate around the either you're in favor or against AI, uh, you know, as if black and white is an efficient approach. But, you know, we've seen that before. So, and you characterize in between China and the US, so would you characterize, I guess, China as highly regulated and the U.S. not regulated at all? Is that sort of the conception? And in AI, I guess it's kind of hard to know. China, in some ways, wants to keep AI from being too much of an issue for them, so they might actually regulate more. Uh, I mean, the U.S. wants no, to No, no, saying like China, like China, you, in you. some cases, uses the technology, but also, you know, I would say, or you just take any kind of authoritarian system. AI is sort of danger to them as well. Actually, if if you look at China's own rules, part of those actually demand that AI models are like explainable, open to evaluation, and not used for like organized crime. And that's that's quite similar to the proposals from the US, the UK, and Europe. As much as we don't like to admit it, at the moment we are talking, there there are things in motion in the US administration to to promote safe 
secure, trustworthy AI systems. I don't think we can expect something that will be quickly embedded into actual law. And that there, you know, it might be a new administration next year that could reverse everything. And I think it's unlikely that a comprehensive bill on this will be introduced next year. But there are there are definitely efforts in other parts of the world to regulate. But Europe wanted to be the first, and it was in the, in, in the lead. And now. Things are changing, not just a race to innovation and technology development, but also legislation. So it's becoming from all parts something. So maybe the EU had this nose to see, okay, this is becoming important. Let's try to be the first. And now maybe they're not going to be the first, or at least not with the only interlocutor around this. So they might not be able to have this. AI I'd copy pasted everywhere as much as they think they would achieve. So I don't know. So what kind of inspired you personally to to jump in the waters here of AI regulation. It's obviously a pretty, you know, contentious and complicated topic. That's actually the reason. Like you get to learn every day in this field. I will never be fully an expert because there are many other topics I cover and that I must follow. I try to avoid 5G cybersecurity for a few years, but then it just became so uh, transversal. You, you can't, uh, you need to get knowledge about everything. And it's exhausting, but I do, I, I'm, I'm kind of a bulimic for information, and I do like the complexity in itself and the complexity of the arguments in that conversation around the benefits, you know, the risks of the technology and, and the hidden hin- interests, the political interests, the, the, what's at stake politically. So it's a vibrant field. So, yeah, it's never bored. And so, you know, we have a long history of, of new technologies in Europe. We had the printing press, right? And and a and hundred years of war afterward, you know, so from the printing press up to the internet, we've had new technologies and, and we've dealt with them in various different ways. So in your experience working with the EU's digital policy, how do you think the current response to AI is, you know, more maybe risk, but more on the existential side compared to the past reactions um, to technology revolutions? Say the modern regulatory era, maybe from the 16th or 70s, we, we did see calls to restrain technological risks already through regulation, while seeing at the same time um, competing concerns that regulation could hobble progress and, and new technology. Um, and technology and, and regulation are often uh, posed as, as adversaries. Uh, so I would say that the reactions are probably similar and equivalent with sometimes two sides confronting each other. Um, but we've also seen it in past phases of um, tech progress and industrial revolutions. We've seen also deregulation of economic regulations. So in the mid-70s, you had you could see ec- economic regulations being repeatedly dismantled in this phase. Uh, prioritization, deregulation, they, they came to govern Western perspectives. I think in the U.S., they deregulated airlines, banking, even trucking. And you, know, you had the breakup of at and telephone monopoly. And, and, and simultaneously, we also saw the explosive growth of um, social regulation, you know, with more health and safety um, rules, so uh, a boost to risk regulation, actually. And then some fears and concerns as, as reactions to tech advances, uh, tech advances, uh, advances, sorry, are not new. Um, so you find today what you could call the descendants of the British Judites, you know, in the 19th century. Smashing the, the, wind, yeah. the looms, yeah. the automated looms. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and now today you have that people, those people calling for attacks on robots. So yeah, the fear of machines and uh, like about yeah. replacing human uh, jobs, that's not new. But today, uh, the difference maybe that this skill uh, of AI um, gives, you know, it gives it this multiplier is hacked in, in many areas of, of society. And now some choose to focus on the existential risks, so-called frontier AI, like the more elaborated AI, rather than the current capabilities, uh, you know, stuff like AI engineered bioweapons, uh, automated cyber attacks, super intelligent AI systems that you, we could lose control uh, of, and that's also not new. Now the idea that policymakers have to do something about it, we've never tried to do that in other areas of industry at the stage of a technology's development. So maybe that's new. And some people believe that the imminent threats posed by AI are exaggerated and that regulating AI is too premature. But overall today, most uh, Western democracies, um, major AI companies, they agree on the need for regulation. So and again, we might come to that later. But so that wake up call, 
political circles and people were just all seeing how information revolution and social media had started to impact our lives in recent years. So there was a sense that we have to become more intentional about how our democracies interact with what is primarily generated from uh, by the private sector. Um, you know, maximizing the good and minimizing the bad. So what rules for the road? Well, I think we're more strongly realizing the transformational aspect of the technology. Um, and the government wants and needs to be aware of what's going on. There's a need uh, to know about, you know, like transparency, having guardrails and, and guard technology uh, while preserving innovation for some. It's a difficult balance. But so it sounds to me like like one of the things you're drawing out there is that the maybe the experiences with GDPR or or maybe some to some extent people see like the cloud and those sorts of revolutions weren't quite regulated as early and social, right? So that's sort of informing um, the policymaker now saying, hey, we need to get on top of this and not fall behind like we did last time. Is that sort of a sense you get? Yeah, I wish I could say yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> we have tech assessments and regulatory impact assessments to assess the impact of new regulations, but we haven't seen much regulatory innovation to devise alternative regulatory designs like test and practice and select the best performing approaches. So, and even for those sitting at the table right now, it's not even clear where they're on the process uh, and the negotiations, where they're at, because the text is just, for the AI Act, for instance, is just extremely long and complex. And there's some pushback to believe that we should or could make it a, a GDPR 2.0 because it's not as simple. Like other countries and regions haven't exactly just copy pasted our stuff. And uh, the lessons learned are that, okay, we've maybe put too much of an historic burden on companies, but this is not necessarily the discourse. It's not yet recognized by the institutions, not all of them anyway, that should have maybe looked at that first. And, and the GDPR, sometimes there are a few articles that are not fit to the needs of some technologies that have emerged since the GDPR was uh, was written. So AI, blockchain, you know, those things, they, they require a lot of data collection, stuff that the GDPR did not necessarily... Um, Interesting. Um, yeah. So G GDPR is definitely sort of informing this debate, but maybe we haven't learned the lessons yet enough of, not, not of GDPR. Enough. Gotcha, gotcha. And so, yeah, so that kind of, if you think about you're in this intersection between the policymakers and researchers. So how, you know, is there a disconnect between what the researchers are talking about and looking toward and, and the policymakers? So it sounds a little bit like yes is the answer. Yeah, I mean, that, that could have helped, for instance. So I think, I, yeah, I, I actually wrote a piece one, one uh, a week ago, some time ago about that. There is evidence of a lack of efficiency and innovation in the process of policymaking anyway, uh, in particular when, when you have policies designed uh, and delivered, and that's an issue because uh, uh, policies that are poorly designed, they risk being inefficient and, and, and they can be counter productive. And that can negatively impact businesses and you know, public organizations alike and or enforcement even by authorities. And I already think we have to realize that when policymakers, when they, we, uh, it was recently at the EPP, when they pass a new law, all firms will have to translate it to their uh, tech infrastructure. And that's not always a walk in the park. It can be impractical at best uh, and at worst uh, impossible. So we have to ensure that policies impacting the, the digital economy as a whole will, will be viable and not just presumably, but also through empirical, uh, technical specifications, investigations. So we would need more formal involvement of, of more technologists, tech experts in the process, what you see right now. And to give you just a couple of uh, concrete examples, they could, um, I don't know, they could be in, uh, invited to like advise on the um, feasibility of drafted rules, uh, give their interpretation to amend uh, current regimes, existing uh, regimes. That could adjust for the um, uh, evolution of dynamics in the uh, digital economy and, you know, design a process to co-create or, or build new regulatory frameworks. Yeah. Well, they could maybe use AI to regulate AI. Would that be? I, I'm not sure we'll we'll manage to get that into the brain of policymakers yet, but one day maybe. Uh, yeah, exactly. But I mean, it, there are probably some specific areas in AI where you you know you could get a deeper understanding that could lead to a more nuanced way of regulating. I would assume, right? That must be something that we need to look at and 
what it can teach us to help us do regulation better. Just like I think you referred to, you know, AI helping us make better policy. Mm -hmm. AI can help us make better regulations, right? I know that there's this idea of deliberative democracy um, that you could use AI tools. I think a bit like Taiwan does uh, with this platform, they basically collect opinions and they use the digital tools out there to even just connect with what the interests and needs of the people are. So using digital tools in public administration to craft regulation, yeah, I think that's something we would ideally want to want to go for. It would be great to regulate something whose evolution can be predicted anyway. So deeper understanding, sure. But for AI system, it's really hard. It's worth considering how tricky it will be for bureaucratic democracies to keep up with a technology that can quite literally teach itself how to change and adapt to, to its environment. So the argument is uh, regulating too strictly all types of systems that could amount to regulating the uh, airline industry in the 20s. When some types of aircraft, like uh, I think jet planes, they, they had not yet been invented or at least not fully developed or commercialized. So maybe to reconcile both sides of the argument, we have to accept that regulations, to be nuanced, they, they should integrate some degree of flexibility to phase those um, advances more efficiently. So yeah, I, need, I think we need to, to move towards uh, better understanding, particularly uh, when it comes to AI, to regulate. And we need to, to, to actually move faster to come up with mechanisms to make AI governance a reality. Like some sort of transparency reporting or disclosure reporting in terms of how a company is acquiring AI or how they're building AI systems. That's a great step to ensure AI is actually in service um, to the citizens because in the end, that's one of the purposes of legislation, right? To, to serve citizens, I think. And it seems like, you know, as I think you kind of referred to the international dialogue as converging on some sort of global rules. Um, at least people are talking about it that way. So if we looked at sort of global rules for AI, what would that involve? And what do you think it means for Europe, the US and other countries, you know, in terms of their influence or their ability to innovate, those kind of things? So uh, if you look at the international dialogue right now, there are a few things uh, maybe for people to know. Uh, there are talks for G7 voluntary code of conduct uh, for AI companies. And overall, there are signs of political will to make an effort to come up with global rules or at least norms on AI safety uh, in particular. But one question is um, whether Western democracies will uh, forge one like coordinated path on AI regulation, leaving other countries, especially China, out of the process. And the G7 route, uh, like the Hiroshima process, that sort of seems to be Beijing out and other organizations that are helping to shape global norms like uh, the OECD, the G. AI, so the Global Partnership on AI, they don't have China as a member, I think. So the direction it's taking, like some people have also proposed some sort of an AI equivalent to the IPCC, so the, um, the panel on climate change. The idea that you had this UN that group of, of scientists that set aside geopolitics for, for that greater cause. Uh, now, there, there were political quarrels in there, um, and, and you know, a lot of, of the work had, had first to fall on uh, just years. Um, but the flurry of activity right now, it shows that Western nations are converging on AI rulemaking. And democracies agree a lot. They agree on a lot more than, than they don't when it comes to AI. But it, when it comes to um, evergreen tenets like uh, transparency, high levels of uh, data protection, security, accountability, that we must build into those uh, complex systems, everyone can agree that those are good things. But just like perspectives differ on how to regulate, what these tenets actually mean um, differs remarkably depending on whom you talk to. But European values are, of course, shared by UK, US, but the US connects AI a bit more with its implications on for national security. Uh, it's also a lot about how the US can develop AI to compete with China. That's the narrative and, and the very sure that the US is looking at. And there's some sort of competition about who could be the leader in this debate now. You can see it emerging. It's becoming common to see politicians eager, eager to show out their credentials for handling AI, like collaborating with like minded governments, 
competing to portray themselves as global translators because AI is a sexy topic and, and they want to be seen as, as responsive. Yeah, exactly. Well, the fastest way to get a budget in the United States is to say, "Oh, we're falling behind China on that." So, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> that's a good. That's a good. Yeah. Uh, that's a yeah. good budget request. Tactic, in the EU, so. when you say that they work on on eggshells, it's not. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> Caught in between. So, I mean, but that is, I mean, I, I'm curious how much of the debate in the EU really is about the concerns of lagging behind potentially on the technology. You sort of mentioned that before yeah. behind in sort of the overall digital race, um, trying to foster a, a more vibrant tech ecosystem there. Um, so how do you think policymakers there are thinking about balancing that? You know, you, you, you talk to the Silicon Valley key, yeah. you know, I think the term techno optimist is sort of taken over where they want the government completely out. And then you've got parts of the larger companies that want, you know, open AI, Google, Microsoft, who yeah. want the government to come in and regulate based on their interests. Um, so how are people thinking about that in that, that balance in the EU? There are concerns from industry and that's been on the table for a while now that uh, if you regulate too much, especially foundation models, uh, general purpose AI, that could have bad effects on the startups ecosystem. Um, and it could fuel um, uh, legal uh, ambiguity um, at a time when smaller players, they, they need regulatory stability more than ever. So those burdensome uh, obligations, red tape, complex compliance and rules, that could affect nascent startups and their ability to scale they don't have the resources and the lawyers. So even if um, the AI ads could have some baseline requirements for the dominant market players, you know, those that are releasing very powerful models, for instance, uh, when it comes to foundation models, it's not necessarily good enough for, for European companies. And I think you hinted at that earlier, and I wanted to circle back to that briefly, is it depends what you regulate and how. And, and I think we're starting to see signs that there are voices regarding how we then we should regulate this extension ex existential risk of ai uh we're seeing that emerge in the uk in the eu i'm not sure that narrative will be um, something that you will eventually buy into but there's a conversation happening there it's a narrative that's pushed about how you prevent how you, how you should prevent catastrophic harms caused by AI. And so I'll argue that certain companies are trying to make policymakers approach AI in a certain way that will enable them to get the investor's attention, you know, drive a regulatory capture, making it more complicated for startups and smaller firms to comply uh, with certain requirements that would have been set. And if I may just squeeze that into the, our talk, existing AI systems that, that cause demonstrated harms are more dangerous than maybe the hypothetical sentient AI systems, because they're so real. Uh, and so we shouldn't get sidetracked and we should focus on, on short-term or imminent risks. And that's key because it matters to people daily. I mean, like mundane, uh, real practical, the expression rubber meets the road kind of problems like uh, disinformation, uh, cyber attacks, bias, infringement, work displacement. That's more right now. And if we think of generative AI, it's more likely to amplify existing risks than create new ones, I think, in the short term. Yeah, the worry, I think, here in the U.S., and particularly in the techno-optimist community, is that we're going to focus on short-term job protection and protection for certain interests that, you know, are going to be upset by AI. Maybe that's other companies that their business model is no longer relevant. Um, and so the worry is, look, there's a creative destruction process that happens. You know, we don't employ, you know, I, what was it like 50% or 60% of Americans were farmers in 1850. And now it's like 1% of the population or something, you know, something to that effect. So I think that's sort of the, the biggest fear in the United States is that we'll have this protectionist sort of policy regime that will really keep us from realizing the benefits. And no one, you know, the future jobs that might be created are not at the table because they don't exist yet. And so I think that's probably the concern here. Yeah, that's a fair point. And actually, the, um, you know, people, they, they see, we see that in surveys, in polls. Uh, we had this year of barometer and, and things. And, and I think people, they see digitalization still as, you know, decisive and important for the future. And it has potential, especially for some sectors. But they don't see progress. 
uh, you have trust in digital literacy that's stagnating. And companies um, and their, their, their optimism vis-a-vis -vis technologies, that could easily fade. Enhancing the focus on, on EU citizens and businesses and what matters to them now, that's essential if you want to send a message through. And you, you need to support them through the, that transformation. You need to get them on board. And that's just not words that you hear in political speeches. Remember, in the, um, you know, with globalization, a lot of people lost their jobs. And what you see today is the societal pushback against globalization. Uh, whether you're, um, you understand this or not, or you argue in favor or not, we cannot let the same happen with digital transformation. At least in Europe, we cannot afford this. So we need to acknowledge that gap. We need to equip the people. Uh, not just with like connectivity, Wi-Fi, you know, 5G and, and good infrastructure, but also by spending more energy on, on education that will prepare people psychologically and with skills mm. so that they know, okay, labor market challenges. That's not the first time we went through this, but also how to master the technology and, and not fear them, but rather trust them and want to study them so they can achieve even more benefits for their lives. And so... We really need to pay attention to that and, and bring so, digital closer to people. So they don't try to needs. smash the data centers? Is that the, right? Uh, exactly. It's harder exactly. to get into those. We all want to do that every now and then. But, uh, <laughs> I think it's harder than the loom thing, but um, maybe. So it's really so there's really this gap between public perception of technology and the realities of AI development that are going to come. So that's yeah. that's the gap politicians are going to have to overcome. That seems daunting. Yeah. I think we actually don't know enough. <laughs> Uh, yeah. We don't know enough about, about people. You, know, you talked about the ability of regulation potentially to evolve, right? And have things embedded in it. So like you mentioned, hey, we have bi-wing aircraft and like then we came up with the jet. And so the regulations wouldn't have worked. Um, so how can the EU or other governments for that matter craft a more forward-looking regulation that's more adaptive like that? Are there some ways that you've been thinking through that that can, that can be done? Well, two things. Uh, I think we kind of discussed it earlier. Consult stakeholders. Don't act in isolation. Uh, have an international dialogue. Uh, don't act out of arrogance, you know, with that Brussels effect thing. Involve technologists. Use the diversity of mechanisms. So things like deliberative governance, uh, democracy, participatory governance, uh, impact assessments, uh, red teaming is often... Uh, discussed or put forward as an idea, ensure the consistency and the coordination across the policies that you're adopted, that you're adopting for this sector. Developers, activists, academics who aren't in the centers of powers, I think they're worried, like the future will look exactly like right now, you know, something with a lack of, of coordination in governments. And there's a lot of concern that governments will just gone. On, on rules before knowing what to do. If you have a touch of regulations focused on, on different priorities, that might complicate what companies and also policymakers are trying to do. Uh, so sometimes the, the kind of annoying thing is that you notice in the end, there's a huge gap between the goals and the reality of, of these laws. And sometimes when we make policies, we should keep in, in mind a little bit more that the reason industry hasn't adopted already some solutions is because the solution is just isn't yet, it's not there yet. Yeah, I yeah, know, that's great. Well, that's awesome. Okay, so I when I got the sheet on Aileen, I was reading through all her illustrious work. And in the middle, there was this one career break that I saw. And I was like, what is this? I, this must be a misprint. So I went to her on LinkedIn. And sure enough, Aileen is not only an amazing scholar and policymaker, she has also took a little career break to be a, uh, to work with British Airways. So tell us a little bit about why, what led you to do that and what you learned from it. So it's not because I had some sort of a midlife crisis. <laughs> I had been working already for five or six years. So I had a good, uh, interesting professional experience. Actually, I really liked my colleagues and, and my job. I was working at the time in The Hague at the Center for Strategic Studies on uh, security and defense questions, actually, at the time. That was almost 10 years ago. Um, I just want to change in my life. And I think uh, a lot of people can relate. Um, and it could have been applying to OECD and a typical thing. But then one friend of mine said, hey, I'm, I'm following this training for Lufthansa, the German airline. What? You have a master's degree. Why would they want people like us? And one day, I just applied online to British Airways, not Air France, I'm French, but, but they didn't recruit. 
And when, when the time came that they sent me the application, I followed the process and then I had a yes. And it was like, this, this feels good. And what I learned was that, um, okay, you need to like, so what, so what was your job? job. Gotta explain. So yeah, I'm sorry. We share his flight attendant. Okay, that's yeah. amazing. Going <laughs> from, going from making defense policy to people thought I was either brave or crazy. Um, I didn't think I was either of that. I, I just knew it was going to be temporary and I, I made the most, the most of it. And what I found is this is a specific species of people. You really need to, to like others. And, uh, it's just very interesting. It's an interesting industry. Of course, it wasn't for the travel uh, part. Of course, I went places, but I don't know. It was kind of a break, uh, not having to do lists, uh, just having to take care of myself, uh, seeing beautiful places. And, uh, I don't know. I could do it again in a heartbeat. Well, it's always good to know that you have the backup plan. So, and it's a little, you know, not nothing uh, wrong with being a flight attendant, but it, you know, you don't have to think probably quite as much. It's just like interacting with people, right? No, and when I arrived in Brussels six years ago, I was just coming out of Rich Airways, and I had no idea what the GDPR was. I had no idea what AI was, so I had to learn everything from scratch when it comes to tech policy. So, yeah, it really, you think about other stuff. I was still very much into information and, and news, but politics all the time right, right. But, okay uh, so yeah. what's the best route to get on like what does everybody want to do cape, cape town. town okay because is it just because yeah. of the because what's at they, the end or is it, it gives you a long thing and then you don't have to work it, it's a long trip uh, if you're just a regular customer it's very expensive uh and you have to go for two weeks and maybe it's once or twice in a lifetime uh but they have everything they have the sunset they have the red meat they have the wine uh, they have the mountains, uh, they have, uh, you know, it's I went two years ago, climb, but I, did, I was not on, I think I was on Lufthansa. Yeah, uh, oh, yeah well, BA yeah. is a lot better. They're Lufthansa, okay. I don't recommend it. I don't recommend it. <laughs> no, I could never say BA is like, you know, I'm French. So I still think you have right. the best. Right. <laughs> and if they had recruited, you would have worked there, right? So, excellent. Well, Maybe, but you know, with it. Well, the AI world is very happy that you came back. So after your after your sojourn. Thank so, you, Aileen. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thanks so much. And uh, likewise, we really appreciate it. Bye bye. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's been a, an honor to be on your podcast. So thank you. AI government and the future is brought to you by Corner Alliance. To find out more about Corner Alliance and how we work with government to create results, visit our website at corneralliance.com and then make sure to search for AI Government Future in Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Google Podcasts or anywhere else podcasts are found and click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Corner Alliance, thanks for listening.